Thank you very much for that intro, Mike, and um, thanks to the SF Bitcoin devs for having me. Um, I am indeed associate counsel at Coinbase. Prior to Coinbase, I worked for a couple of law firms, primarily based in the DC area. Um, background in business, and then I represented financial institutions for a few years, and so when Bitcoin came along, it was sort of this interesting mix of business and finances and ways to sort of fix what I saw as problems um, in financial litigation that I did work on. Um, I eventually found my way to California and to Coinbase, and uh, here I am now. Um, the sort of overview that I want to do are sort of the W's of Bitcoin regulation. Uh, why is Bitcoin regulated? Who regulates it? Um, when should Bitcoin entrepreneurs be concerned about regulations? And what are the predominant concerns, best practices, and development, de developments for Bitcoin regulation? Um, and as I'm going through, please feel free to interrupt me with any questions that you have around point. I will be happy to take them as we go. Although if we get sort of too far off topic on any questions, um, I might end up hunting it till the end and uh, we, can, we can revisit it then. So why is Bitcoin regulated? Um, the way I like to think about this is why is to first step back and think, why is anything regulated? Um, the food service industry has a bunch of regulations on what good standards are for health practices, and it's because they want to keep the consumer safe. They want to keep people who are eating in restaurants from getting food poisoning. Um, there's uh, regulation around driver's licenses. How old are you before you're able to get a driver's license? What is the speed limit that you're allowed to drive at? And again, these are all sort of built around um, the regulatory schemes that are built around the idea that we should protect consumers who are engaging in whatever the given activity is. Um, so to figure out what the given activity is for Bitcoin, we have to also step back and think about um, what, what Bitcoin really is. And as everyone in this room knows, very well, and, and many of you probably better than I do. Um, the word Bitcoin is used to describe more than one thing. Uh, we use Bitcoin to talk about the protocol, uh, the blockchain technology is often just called Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is also a payment network. It's a way that um, we can transfer from one place uh, value from one place to another. And on top of that, uh, we talk about Bitcoin as the digital currency, which sometimes acts like uh, virtual cash, and it sometimes acts as sort of a digital commodity. It's a, a piece of property. Um, and so when we think about how do we regulate payment networks and how do we regulate cash, um, and how do, how do we regulate sort of these concepts that encapsulate Bitcoin, uh, we frequently end on sort of the financial uh, focus. And when we think about um, what regulators care about when it comes to financial um, services, you can think about sort of the Western unions of the world or the PayPal's of the world where you're giving your money to a, a company or a third party and you're trusting them to do something with it. What concerns do regulators have uh, when you're doing that? Um, and the number one concern, as with many regulations, is to protect consumers. Uh, Many consumer protection laws are actually oriented uh, to be regulations that are made to turn sensible business practices into something that's uh, defined by law. Um, I have a coffee cup on here because I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, McDonald's being sued for um, coffee that spilled onto some poor man's hand and burned him very badly. And now every time you order a coffee cup from anywhere, pretty much, um, it has a little warning on it that says, caution, contents may be hot. And that's just a sensible business, uh, business practice that companies put into place um, in order to sort of let consumers know what it is that they're getting into when they're using that product. Um, in the same kind of line of thinking, a lot of the disclosures regarding um, financial, a lot of the disclosures and receipt requirements that financial institutions and money services businesses are held to um, are again kind of ca uh, the rationale behind them is to protect consumers so that everyone um, on the street who goes in to give money to this money services business can sort of sort of knows that oh there's this standard there's this level of um, sort of protection that I have as a consumer if I'm going to be using this product or service that's being offered to me um, Another major aspect of the sort of financial climate is the prevention of money laundering to and from both illicit activity as well as illicit actors. 
Um, and of course, regulators are interested in taking their bite at the apple and making sure they're taxing things appropriately. So it's bad as sort of the backdrop of why we regulate, um, but why we have regulations generally and, and why we have sort of financial services regulations specifically. Um, the next question becomes who regulates Bitcoin related activity? And um, in the US at least, we have a, a handful of federal uh, regulatory considerations as well as state level regulatory considerations. Um, on, the, on the federal level, OFAC, the Office of Foreign Asset Control, um, is interested in screening customers based on their name or their geographic location and they're primarily focused on the um, anti-money laundering aspect of, of financial regulation. The SEC has said that Bitcoin itself is not a security, but financial products, crypto equity products, um, and or Ponzi schemes that are related to Bitcoin may end up triggering liability under securities laws. So that's a particular note if you're doing something that's related to Bitcoin, but maybe not necessarily money or cash specific, um, you might want to be looking at what the SEC has to say and, and any guidance that they come out with uh, with respect to the business. Um, CFTC, Quantum Future Trading Commission, has not issued any formal guidance to date, uh, but they have stated the view that they have authority over Bitcoin futures and swaps um, because Bitcoin is a commodity which is also related to how the IRS has defined Bitcoin. Their guidance issued um, in 2014, early last year, indicated that Bitcoin would be treated as a property or a commodity for federal tax purposes. Um, and then the CFPB is, in, uh, is interested in this consumer protection um, idea. They've indicated that the prepaid rule may have potential application of virtual currency and related products, but the analysis is still ongoing. Um, and the reason I touch on all of these is because, um, as I'll get into more detail later, Coinbase, of course, has a number of financial services related products, um, and those are the ones that we, uh, sorry, go ahead. So can you explain the prepaid rule, please? Um, the prepaid rule is rules related to providing like prepaid access uh, to funds. An example being um, what you do when you buy an iTunes gift card or an Amazon card. Um, when you buy Bitcoin, are you buying prepaid access to something specific? So so far, um, it, so so far they haven't said in any given way that it is. But you can see where there's at least some similarity um, when you buy an Amazon card. There's only a certain subset of things that you can buy uh, with that prepaid access card is, is what the most common current use is. Um, when you buy Bitcoin in today's world, realistically speaking, there's only so many uses you can have for that. So it's something that they've at least kind of chimed in and said, we're interested in this. Um, and yeah, the reason that it's important to look at sort of all of the different ways Bitcoin can be regulated is because um, while our business focuses largely on the financial services implications, I recognize that there are many other ways to use Bitcoin technology, and I'm sure many people in this room are doing exciting things with that. And as you think about the future of your business, uh, these are at least a handful of the agencies whose guidance you should kind of be paying attention to, and um, it would be you know, prudent to sort of keep tabs on what it is that they might have to say with your business, with respect to whatever your business model is um, going forward. Uh, then, of course, everyone's federal favorite is FinCEN. Um, I think. There was, a, there was a very noticeable um, sort of like seizure of frustration or, or um, worry, maybe is the better word, when FinCEN first issued its virtual currency guidance in spring of 2013. Um, and in that guidance, they said that an exchanger is a person engaged as a business in the exchange of virtual currency for either real currency, funds, or other virtual currency. Um, and an exchanger that accepts and transmits convertible virtual currency or buys and sells convertible for virtual currency for any reason is a money transmitter under FinCEN's regulations. And the reason that's important is because if you are a money transmitter under FinCEN's regulations, that makes you a money services business or an MSB um, for FinCEN's purposes, which triggers a handful of uh, record keeping requirements, customer identification requirements, um, and sort of all of the compliance nightmare that many Bitcoin companies sort of run into when they think about FinCEN and, and, and moving forward with uh, developing a business. Um, there was a, this was the, 
the 2013 guidance was sort of reiterated and reinforced um, by the Undersecretary of T Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, uh, David Cohen, last March. Um, and at that point, he said, at present, the crux of FinCEN's regulatory framework for convertible virtual currencies focuses on the moment real money is exchanged into virtual currency and when virtual currency is exchanged back into real money. And so what that tells you and all of us uh, as Bitcoin companies is that what FinCEN's really looking at is the sort of entry and exit rails uh, to Bitcoin, at least at this point in time. Um, on the state level, we have a variety of state money transmission um, regulators, and this is, this is the heart and soul of what I spend a lot of my time working on. Um, and there's sort of a, a spectrum of what different states have said um, Bitcoin is or what virtual currency is. On um, sort of the narrow scope, we have states like Texas, which have very clearly defined um, money to not include Bitcoin. And so if you're only involved in a Bitcoin business, um, you are not involved, if you're, in, sorry, if you're involved in a Bitcoin only business, you're not involved in something that re requires um, licensure according to their money, existing money transmission statute <coughs> because Bitcoin does not equal money um, according to their interpretation. Um, and then sort of in the middle of the road, we have um, CSBS framework that's been um, sort of promulgated. They haven't come up with anything formal yet, but they're sort of working on drafting a framework that um, looks at regulating virtual currency a little bit more than, for example, the Texas regulation, but um, doesn't go so far as the infamous bit license in New York. Um, and I think many people in this room are probably familiar with um, the bit license regulation, but what that does is um, very heavily regulates Bitcoin, not only by um, making many Bitcoin activities require a license, but it's also an entirely separate license from the existing money transmission regime. Um, and so it would require a company like Coinbase, um, who is involved in both normal US dollar sides of the business as well as Bitcoin sides of the business to obtain two entirely separate licenses um, in order to continue operations. Um, and in addition to sort of the, the high state level um, money service business regulations that exist, there's also a number of um, sort of more local tax related um, and sort of corporate structure related things that anyone who's looking to set up a business should kind of be paying attention to, um, whether that's registering with your state as just an entity, um, whether you are required to register in your city. San Francisco has a lot of these requirements um, to be registered as a business in the city of San Francisco and, and pay any associated franchise taxes or business taxes. Um, I think Alice has a question on that. I was wondering if any of the parties up there on the board are multi-state projects or if there are any multi-state, I know like some state laws are approaching like collectively and, and everyone adopts sort of similar rules. Is there any multi-state effort in Bitcoin? Yeah, um, the framework that the CSBS is, has started drafting is intended to be that. It doesn't go so far as to put up like a model um, framework, at least it hasn't to date, but they've put out a um, sort of request for information which a number of companies, um, you know, like BitPay and, and Coinbase both have submitted comments of kind of this um, sort of taking our knowledge of what it's been to, to be a virtual currency business to date and, and saying here's how we think um, certain aspects of traditional money transmission transmission licensing rules should or should not apply to virtual currency businesses. Um, so that's the, that's the closest one to date. Another question? Uh, it's, it seems as though virtual currency, I mean, there's, uh, I guess, questions about the legal definition of what's a currency. The IRS and the, I think the other institution um, define it as a commodity. Right. So, I mean, to us, you know, there may be uh, I mean, virtual currency sounds like Bitcoin, I mean, like you know, uh, Litecoin and others, but it seems as though legally defined it could be different, and it may be like a virtual commodity rather than a virtual currency. Is that? I mean, can you yeah, that's that? yeah, that's um, that's that's correct. I like to um, 
I like to joke, but it's actually not really a joke that only in the U.S. with our federalism system do we get 54 different ways to define money transmission. Um, because every state in the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands and the federal government um, can each define virtual or sorry can each define money transmission, and most of them do as something slightly differently. Um, and so it's yeah it it. It can be uh, very much a headache, and it's why states like Texas um, or uh, Kansas have come in and said, you know, our definition of money transmission is related specifically to money, and we define money as only a currency issued or backed by a government. And so Bitcoin clearly is not a money or currency issued or backed by a government. So their entire statute for money transmission doesn't apply to Bitcoin companies. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, you have New York um, with its new proposed regulation, as well as, um, I think, Vermont's current regulation has been interpreted so, such that the definition of money transmission, money is defined as this more nebulous, ambiguous thing, such that virtual currencies might fall under that umbrella. Um, so it's a, it's a matter of ch checking what the rules are, as well as developing relationships with the regulators and kind of checking in to say, we think it means this, what do you think? Um, and, and that's just sort of what the, the position that we're in right now. I see this point as for us all to back up into Texas because I think this applies to the consumers and the state, right? That's correct. Yeah. Um, so this sort of ties in with your question um, about all the different definitions. Uh, the next question is when should Bitcoin entrepreneurs be concerned about regulations? And um, again, Half jokingly, but half seriously, it's always compliance time. Um, it's, it's always prudent to have an idea of who might eventually want to regulate your idea, even if there's no current existing uh, very definitive guidance on it. Um, and to do that, we can go back to the first question of, of why regulate and think about, okay, um, my idea is similar to this other thing that already exists. What regulators regulate that thing that already exists? Um, and maybe that's who I need to be starting a conversation with. Um, developing relationships with regulators can have both short-term and long-term benefits. Um, in the short term, you can have more certainty about your business. So in the example of going to a state and saying, hey, you know, we think our business doesn't require a license because we're doing this and your statute excludes this. Um, can we get some guidance there? They're able to write you a letter back or call you back and, and tell you, send you an email in some cases and say, yeah, your analysis is correct. We agree you don't need a license. And in the short term, that's great because you have some more certainty with how to conduct your business. Um, in the long term, it sets you up to have the chance to shape the way the regulators think about that business. So maybe they say, we agree with your analysis right now, uh, but we're about to get started on a new piece of legislation because we're kind of scared about what it is you're doing. Uh, but since you reached out to us, we'd like your input. Um, how do you think we should be thinking about this? And that's a large part of um, what I've had the honor of, of getting to do is um, talking to companies who, through, um, through working at Coinbase, um, but we've reached out to and, and, and sort of started this money transmission licensing process where when they have questions about how they're going to rewrite their laws or write new laws, um, they're able to come to us and say, well, we're thinking about doing it this way, does that make sense? Um, and it puts you in a unique position to sort of not only have certainty with respect to your operations now, but also shape the way um, future companies will be able to operate as well. Um, and then it's always important to ask yourself these, these questions of why might a regulator want to regulate your project um, when you're looking at a new market or a new product because, again, um, every state and the federal government has the opportunity to define the same thing a little bit differently. So if you're changing something, um, it, it could be a different answer depending on the jurisdiction. Sorry, your question? Um, yes, about the relationship with regulators. Um, I was just wondering, like you mentioned, like, oh, like, the email you got, it's good, or like, I'm going to call with them, but I was wondering, like, do you, do you know, like, do you have, like, in your experience, like, some states where you actually need to be physically there and have this conversation one-on-one, -on -one, or, like, it, or it would actually help to actually be there and, like, have this conversation with regulators? Yeah, and I think, um, I think the answer to that is it absolutely can be helpful to be there, and it's sort of, um, uh, 
you're always going to be have, be having to decide what is valuable for my business right now. What you know, and, and obviously meeting someone in person is going to be a lot more personable, a lot more memorable, and probably more impactful than just sending an email or leaving a voice message. Um, so, you know, if it's a state that matters a lot, I you know. For sure, for sure, people from Coinbase have gone to New York since the bit license has, proposal has come out um, because we see that as an important an important thing to you know develop that relationship and encourage them to sort of um, get it right. <laughs> but um, without and with it, I guess and beyond that, it varies. Um, you know, a lot of these specific state regulators have conferences. Um, so one of the opportunities I've had was to go to one of the conferences where. Almost all the regulators, as well as a lot of the other regulated entities, so so the Western unions and the PayPal's are all in a room, um, and you have the opportunity to sort of just introduce yourself um, without having to physically go to necessarily their office. Um, yeah. And the way that what you're now is uh, talking about is lobby. So if you know, you're talking, you're trying to meet with your with the regulators. Yeah, I can understand Coinbase is a big big Bitcoin company and there's a couple of others, but how do the small small companies do that? Is there is there a unique best approach of, of lobbying with the regulators? Yeah, I think um, for lobbying it's probably the best idea is to find someone who's already doing it and sort of join forces. Um, a large part of what at least my what I try to do with developing relationships is less about lobbying and more about educating. Um, and you know we have some people who work and, and focus more heavily on policy, um, but to, to the extent that um, to the extent that you want to lobby for like a, an actual change, um, I think that's a different activity. So when 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 I go and talk to regulators, it's more um, like corrective action or, or like correcting something they're proposing or it's them asking directly for my feedback just because we have that relationship, um, which I think is different from sort of me having this idea of like, oh, here's how I think you should regulate me, and let me take that to you. And in my mind, that's more of what lobbying is. Um, so I think it depends what your end goal is. If your end goal is to sort of come up with something that you think is a good law that should get put into place, then that's where it probably makes sense to join forces and find other people and, and lobby for that position. Um, but if you are just looking for clarity with respect to like some given status quo, that's where having more informal or formal relationships uh, I think can make a bigger impact. In the, in the legacy of financial system, uh, compliance is just part of the landscape. You know, where you're building systems, new products, uh, you know, a lot of the things that you've mentioned. And then <clears throat> in foreign exchange, um, compliance is a pretty substantial line item. Uh, time, dollars, and everything else. And I'm wondering at your firm, you know, how much <clears throat> money, you don't have to give me a number, but just, you know, is it a big, big chunk or a, you know, a little infinitesimal thing? I think everyone yes. would, you know, <laughs> you know, appreciate. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, compliance is a, is a huge aspect of what we do. Um, and I think in thinking about, um, with, it, with the comparison to foreign exchange and, and those types of systems, um, a large part of that is also uh, fraud concerns. So in thinking about the combination of compliance and fraud resources, they are, they are significant. Um, and in part it's because, um, you know, we want to get it right for our consumers, for our customers, going back to the idea of why these regulations exist to begin with, which is to provide certainty to customers that this company is worth you trusting them with your money or your funds. Um, we take that seriously. We want customers to find us trustworthy and we want them to, um, you know, to know that we're providing them a safe and secure way to use Bitcoin and use the services that we provide. Um, so yeah, we, we definitely put a high focus on, on compliance. Um, so moving into sort of the last bit, of the last W, what are the predominant concerns, best practices, and recent developments for Bitcoin regulation? Um, I think the biggest question that I've seen um, from outside Bitcoin companies or smaller Bitcoin companies, um, even companies that are interested in working with Coinbase, um, is if I'm an MSB for FinCEN purposes, what does FinCEN compliance look like? And sort of the, the four components to a strong MSB compliance program 
uh, are listed here, you need to appoint um, an individual or a set of individuals who will be responsible for managing the BSA compliance program. And that will often be a chief compliance officer or a designated BSA <coughs> compliance officer. Um, essentially someone who, or some group of people who are responsible for ensuring that the company is both developing and implementing um, a, a strong BSA compliance program. What that program needs to look like, um, it's, it's FinCEN and uh, in, in the BSA more broadly require that you uh, both document and implement internal controls for customer identification, um, knowing your customer as well as enhanced due diligence requirements. So. Um, it is, it's, it's a risk-based, it's a sort of tiered mentality, and um, it's sort of this, the BSA is, has, is written such that um, it, it sort of puts the burden on you to figure out where are your biggest risks, where are the biggest concerns um, as, as a company doing whatever it is that you do, and then based on that, um, have the appropriate level of figuring out who your customer is, figuring out you're not being, whether or not you're being lied to about who your customer says they are, um, and then on top of that, certain reporting requirements, um, if there's suspicious activity or if um, transactions are over a certain dollar amount. Um, on top of that, you're required to have independent uh, testing of the AML program and BSA compliance. Um, and that just means having auditors come in and look at your system, um, look, at, look at your system to see that you're doing what it is you say you're doing, as well as look at your documents to make sure that your documents um, are, are taking into consideration everything that they should be. And there has to be regular training for company personnel. Um, and the reason why I think when FinCEN first issued guidance uh, indicating that exchangers of virtual currency were considered MSBs is because this can be a sort of burdensome and expensive set of requirements to fill. Um, and it's um, it's something that they, of course, take seriously or else they wouldn't have issued guidance on it. Um, on the state level, the question is, does my business require a state level license? Uh, Coinbase, of course, is involved in money transmission licensing, but this is also something um, that if you're involved in gambling or sweepstakes, you might be required to look at what the licensing requirements are for that. If you are involved in lending of some sort, there are other licenses for that. Um, Sort of uh, gleaning from my experience, some of the requirements to become licensed, uh, they all vary by state, which again goes to how different states define different aspects of money transmission. Uh, but they often require two years of audited financials. Uh, they require you to put up surety bonds and have permissible, meet certain permiss permissible investment requirements. And basically what that means is that uh, when people, when, when your customers give you money, um, your permissible investments are, um, they can, they can vary what different states will let you do, but essentially you can't just um, take your customer's money and go gamble with it in Vegas for the weekend and, and then be like, oh, sorry. So there's, only, there's a set list of permissible things you can do with money that you're holding on behalf of customers. Um, again, independent review of compliance program and ongoing reporting. Um, we have our green states and blue states where we're currently licensed or um, where licenses aren't currently being issued. Um, and those are the states where we operate our exchange as well as our USD wallet services. Um, and then in the rest of the states, we're working on it. That's what I spend a lot of my time doing. Sarah, for the, um, the on the last slide, the risk-based approach to like KYC and EDD and something, do you have examples of maybe for like a really small team building a product or something, like what specific levels of activity people doing, um, like what sort of levels of customer activity would you have to do each of these things? Yeah, um, so the, the risk base, the, the actual dollar amounts um, start to trigger different reporting requirements and they tend to be um, something like the 2000 or $3,000 mark depending on, um, again, what exactly it is that you're doing and what you might need to be reporting on. Um, if you're dealing with really small dollar amounts, then there's a decent chance um, your compliance program will be a lot simpler. Um, so if you can cap things to a certain amount, again, um, <laughs> not giving legal advice here, but um, but yeah, if you're if you're clearly falling under that dollar threshold within a daily time frame, um, that's a scenario where you can sort of limit your risk and limit your liability. Um, 
and you're still then BSA and FinSEC compliant because you've looked at the risks and you said, well, the maximum anyone can ever do on my platform is $25 worth, and so there's a very small risk that someone is trying to launder money you know, that sums less than $25 at a time. Question? Yeah, um, next slide, like the map of the states the that you are having licenses for. Um, I looked into the NLS, um, and there's like, I don't know, like any Bitcoin firm that has some money just to, to, money just to a license in the state will kind of show up. Mm -hmm. And you do show up in lots of states. And I was wondering if um, those states are, just, are part of them are some that didn't need uh, a license and you just compliant to not having a license or like, I don't know how it works. Yeah, um, yeah. I, for example, um, I think Minnesota is a state and I'm, I'm actually not positive other Minnesota is an NMLS state or not, um, but Minnesota is a state where we went through the process to submit a money transmission, uh, money license for a money transmission <laughs> um, license and um, they came back and their, their analysis to us was such that, um, and, and you can see this actually on the face of their statute, that they don't issue licenses to companies that are not physically in their state. Um, so for example, in Minnesota, where we applied for a license thinking, you know, we want to be licensed, we, want, we, we at least want to let you know what our business model is, and if you think that it falls under your licensing regime, we want to be licensed. If you don't, great. Um, and Minnesota's a place that came back and said, well, per, you know, X, Y statute of our, you know, portion of our code, um, we don't issue licenses to companies that don't have physical presence. And so until or if you ever have physical license in, or a physical presence in Minnesota, you won't need a license to conduct your business. Mm -hmm. Alice, question? Yeah. Um, so you talked about risk assessment and the scope and the kind of the cost of your compliance program is based exactly on your assessment of the risk that your business model presents. Um, can you give an example or maybe describe more what that risk specifically is in a Bitcoin context? You don't have to refer to risks with respect to Coinbase if you don't want to, but like give an example of one that you have in mind. Um, yeah, I guess so. And that's something that goes back to the ideas of um, what these agencies exist to regulate, which is um, frequently their consumer protection or um, anti-money laundering. And in the case of FinCEN, a lot of that has to do with its, its financial crimes, which a large part of it is money laundering. Um, and so um, things that would trigger greater risk are high dollar volume, <coughs> or high, high value amounts. Um, or um, if, you've, if you've had a customer for a long amount of time and um, they only ever buy, say, $100 worth of Bitcoin um, you know, once a week or something like that, and then all of a the sudden they want to buy $100,000 worth of Bitcoin, that's an unusual activity. And that's something that um, a, a, fin a BSA compliance program should look at and say, hey, that kind of raises a red flag. That's not something that they usually do. Um, and Full disclosure: You can't spend hundred thousand dollars at Coinbase, so this is um, <laughs> not at all related to um, the actual dollar amounts of how we think about compliance. But in thinking about um, a, a BSA compliance program, it's both it's related to both amounts as well as um, unusual activity. Outliers. Yes. Yes. Aside from the fact that the regulators are sort of going through the learning curve what this is and as we are all doing that. Um, the, the regulations that are out there, are there, you know, most of this is just sort of complying with what's already in place, right? I mean, there's, there's not anything terribly unique about Bitcoin or virtual currencies that's being applied here, or, or is it in the landscape? Um, I, think it, I think that depends. Okay. Um, so m most of these laws were obviously written without the concept of Bitcoin's existence. Um, and so in a lot of ways, um, they're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole and deciding like, okay, well, we have this set of definitions um, and based on this set of definitions, we actually think Bitcoin falls under it or we don't think Bitcoin falls under it. 
Um, so it's it's some of it is some of it is like already existing things, but a lot of why we see things like the New York Bit license um, or just today. Um, North Carolina's legislature passed a bill, or sorry, their house passed a bill that's now going to the state Senate um, that modernizes their entire money transmission act, um, but in the process has included a whole bunch of sections that are applicable only to virtual currency companies. Um, and it's sort of interesting to also see how regulators approach it, because in some ways, um, what North Carolina is doing is, um, is, is what the bit license could have been. Um, they're just doing it without any fanfare, and it's going through the house, and they're not making a lot of press about it, but um, they're saying that essentially the holding of Bitcoin private keys um, constitutes what is considered stored value under the statute, such that if you were doing that on behalf of a customer, um, you're required to be licensed. But in doing that, they're also allowing you to do, um, this is actually something I was going to touch on on my next slide. Um, they're allowing you to have permissible investments denominated in Bitcoin. So if you are holding Bitcoin on behalf of your customer, um, it makes sense that you are also allowed to hold that amount in Bitcoin. Um, again, permissible investments are this idea that if someone gives you money that you're holding on their behalf, you can't gamble it away in Vegas. Um, if someone gives you Bitcoin on their behalf to hold, if you had to somehow account for that in a dollar amount, it would be really difficult to sort of protect the, to sort of protect the consumer's interest. But this is a hurdle that a lot of regulators um, sort of struggle with because they just see Bitcoin as this thing that they don't really want to think about. They don't. They would just rather think about everything in terms of dollars. Um, and so it's a conversation that we've had to have a number of times, which is that if the goal is to protect consumers, their interest is best protected, allowing permissible investments for Bitcoin to also be denominated in Bitcoin. I feel like I jumped ahead because that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I feel like I've covered a lot of this already in, in previous aspects of this conversation as well as an answer to questions, but um, the relationship development part of state money transmission licensing uh, has been a really neat thing for me to get to be a part of, uh, again, with remembering that a lot of what the states are interested in is consumer, protect, consumer protection. Uh, they want to know that if you give your money to Western Union, Western Union is going to be held accountable for actually doing what it is that you're paying them to do with that. Um, and thinking about Bitcoin-specific sort of regulations, they've asked a lot of things that states have asked a lot about are cybersecurity as well as um, internal controls. And that's stuff that um, in, in sort of the licensing process when in addition to sort of like these form applications that we're required to submit, the questions that they come back to us are usually on these three topics. Um, you know, what are you doing to keep things secure and um, what controls do you have in place and how do you intend to do permissible investments. Um, I think I touched on all of the recent developments already as well, the CSBS framework. Um, MTRA education, that's something that Michael mentioned in his introduction. One of the neat things I've been able to do lately is um, provide webinars for regulators and they're able to sort of sit in and learn about Bitcoin, learn about Coinbase, our products, um, and it puts them in um, a better spot to then have more educated questions to come back and sort of think about how we, how we run our business. Um, with that, I'd like to, oh, question in the back. How many of these regulations will be ex post facto? Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you mean by that? Like, I mean, how many will be retroactive where the regulations haven't been issued, ah. but they'll go back to August of 2014 and say been in violation since then, even though the rules were. Yeah, I haven't seen any, regu any new regulation to date that has any retroactive um, implications. That said, many existing money transmission statutes will say um, if you're doing X business, you're required to have a license. Um, and if you haven't at least asked the state, like, uh, does, you know, X business requires a license, do I fall under that category? Um, if they later find out what you're doing and they think that it does apply to you, um, that's something that already exists in a lot of money transmission statutes. Are there any move-worthy uh, international attempts in Europe or somewhere else to uh, create regulation? 
Um, I know that in Europe, um, the UK is is looking at kind of trying to become, for lack of a better word, an experimental ground of, um, of for money transmission. But um, I don't know personally a whole lot about what that looks like or what sort of the nuances are. Um, but the, I do know that that's that's sort of like the most exciting one to follow right now. To piggyback on the international question. Um, when you have conversations with regulators, are you um, um, talking them from a global perspective? Because Bitcoin doesn't stop regardless of what the U.S. says. And many states are going to see themselves in a position where Africa, South America take off, and whatever regulations are written now are going to be in, um, applied in five years, three years, whatever the case is. In New York, developers are always talking about splitting keys, and the state will have to prove who owns the key, and so on and so forth. Um, so from from uh, uh, the question I'm, uh, I want to ask is, when you're having conversations with, the re uh, with these regulators, are you presenting this from a global perspective and saying, hey, we could actually be way behind? Yeah, it's, uh, and the answer there is it depends on what the conversation is about. Um, again, we're not lobbying, so we're not going to states at this point and saying, please regulate us this way. And in doing so, please think about it from a global perspective. Um, but that said, there are certainly some states that are trying to impose what are essentially duplicative um, requirements as to what FinCEN already requires. Um, and just by way of background, what the, all of the reporting and sort of record keeping that ends up going to FinCEN when, when a money services business of any sort um, reports to FinCEN, that information then becomes available to over 350 law enforcement agencies throughout the U.S. Um, on the state and federal level. And so um, something that, a conversation that we do have that is sort of related um, is that we think it's, it's unnecessary and it's duplicative for states to have their own separate set of anti-money laundering sort of reporting requirements because that state already has access to FinCEN's database and we're already complying with FinCEN. Um, so I'm not sure if that fully answers your question, but that's sort of how we approach the, the global aspect of, of Bitcoin estates. So you're, you're a market leader, you're having all these conversations with all the regulators. I'm wondering over time, how has Coinbase's view of its business changed as a result of all of these discussions? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know that the view of the business has changed. I think probably the conversations have changed. Um, and it also changes every time that um, a, new, a new product or a new market is something that we want to consider comes into play, um, which again kind of goes back to the, it's always compliance time, it's always important to be thinking about um, what regulations might implicate a new thing that you want to be doing. Um, and in that sense, um, that conversation has changed, so um, you know, when Coinbase originally had just a, a, a buy and sell conversion, um, those transactions are always between you and Coinbase. So there's only two parties involved in that exchange um, or that, that trade. Uh, when Coinbase decided, hey, we want to launch an exchange, um, it, inherent in having an exchange is us holding both dollars and Bitcoin on behalf of users. Um, and that's something that looking at money transmission statutes, we, we then said, oh, we're now holding money on behalf of one person in order to send it to another person, and that's no longer just me and you interacting. That's you know you and someone else in the room transacting, and Coinbase is kind of handling all of the dollars or the Bitcoin in the background. Um, and so I think less so than um, it's shaping the way that products are done, it's just shapes the way that we approach which regulators it is that we need to talk to. How much privacy can a Coinbase consumer expect given all the regulations involved? Um, I guess that depends what um, privacy with respect to what. Uh, again, going just back to what the sort of risk-based um, compliance program is that Coinbase is required to have, the less you do with our system, the less we need to know about you. Um, so the more you do with our system, the more we need to know about you. And we value our customers' privacy really highly. We have all, our own internal controls so that um, not everyone can just go in and find out everything it is that you've ever said to Coinbase. Um, but that doesn't mean we're not required to keep certain records um, in keeping with, with the Bank Secrecy Act.
And that is going to be such an awesome app store with a lot of great applications. Do you currently require any of those authors and, and entrepreneurs and developers to be registered as money sources businesses if they do things like remittance using the Coinbase API, or if they do you know games or any sort of value transmission using the Coinbase platform? Is that required or not really? We can just build on those without. Um, yeah, that, I mean that's a on a case by case basis. Our API terms um, still require that you are. Um, not engaging in any prohibited, prohibited practices or prohibited businesses, um, and certainly uh, in the case that you're, you know, actually allowing illegal online gambling, um, that's something that is is clearly um, a prohibited business, and and that's something that um, we would have an obligation to investigate further. Um, but the line for for sort of other businesses is it you know it, it depends. In general, um, we think of our API as something that um, we like we want others to be able to build on. Uh, if there's some sort of contractual basis where I'm um, I'm sending you a referral fee or something because you've referred coin, new Coinbase wallet users, um, in that case, there's there's probably a higher requirement to to make sure that you are operating within the bounds of whatever laws or licenses might be required with respect to your business. Any other questions? So my question is, um, let's say in five years if you had a magic wand, what would you, what would you wish, uh, like which, which direction would you want the regulation to go where it still protects the consumer but allows startups that are, are in the space to be able to like, build companies and not have to worry about spending millions of dollars on a fine. So. Yeah, if I had my wish of all of that. Yeah. Um, I think uh, <laughs> that's, that's a, an ideal world question. Um, I, I think there's a lot of sensibility behind using sort of the FinCEN approach that what we're interested in is the on-ramp and off-ramp to dollars. So if you're only um, dealing with Bitcoin, I think in an ideal world that would not necessarily be regulated the same as if you're dealing only with dollars. Um, that said, in an ideal world in five years, will we still need dollars? That's another question. So, um, evolving, evol evolving ideals as, as we see what the future holds. Uh, with regard to bit license, um, do you think the net impact of bit license, uh, as it's currently proposed, uh, would, would have a positive impact on Coinbase or negative impact on Coinbase or neutral? Um, yeah, I, I guess it depends with what uh, it, from, from what angle. Right. It would certainly be negative in terms of the amount of work it would take for us to sort of get up and running. Um, I don't. I I think. At this point, the only really positive thing I see coming from it is the added legitimacy uh, that it can bring. And I say that because I have plenty of friends um, who are back in DC and who don't understand what this Bitcoin thing is and anything they've ever heard about is Silk Road or Mt. Gox. And when they see New York coming in with these sensible regulations as they see it in the abstract without really having any knowledge, um, it adds some legitimacy to Bitcoin. Um, but beyond that, I don't think I don't think it's helpful beyond the existing money transmission regime that New York has set up, um, and it's certainly costly and burdensome, especially for companies who, like Coinbase, uh, would be required to have both a money transmis transmission license and a bit license. Okay. All right. Well, if there's no further questions, thanks everyone for being here tonight. If you have more questions.